Gold is black, a foot deep. It abounds with good springs, which is our drink. Of beasts I have seen deer, raccoons, squirrels. Of birds diversely feathered there are infinite numbers. By all which, it appeareth the country aboundeth not only with profit, but with pleasure. And to say truth, there wanteth nothing for perfecting of this hopeful plantation, but greater numbers of our countrymen to enjoy it. St. Mary's, Maryland, May 27th, 1634. As the New World continued to make Spain the richest and most powerful nation in Europe, other European nations desired their own share of the New World and began to colonize the Americas. Colonization of the North American coast in the 17th and 18th centuries would forever change the land. The Native Americans who lived there and the European colonists themselves. In the 1500s, northern European sailors crossed the North Atlantic in growing numbers. North America may not have had gold, but it did have fish and fur. Fish provided cheap animal protein. Beaver hats and furs were so popular that Western Europeans had hunted many fur-bearing animals to extinction. But in North America, beaver numbered in the millions. And one of the things that they wanted to do was to set up trading stations with the Indians because there was value in what the forests had. The forests had pelts, the forests had skins from animals, and there was a demand for that in Europe. But the French also thought that not only would the trade bring profit, but it might actually help to pay for settlement. And they looked upon these trading posts as the first step in creating a new France in America. The French had been exploring North America for 80 years before they set up their first permanent trading posts on the St. Lawrence River in the early 1600s. Very quickly, they established a lucrative trade with the Algonquins and the Hurons, who controlled eastern Canada. Farther down the North American coast, the Dutch set their own trading posts on the Hudson River. The New Netherlands colony on Manhattan Island grew quickly on the profits from its fur trade with the Iroquois nations. Native Americans were eager to acquire the Europeans' metal tools and weapons, alcohol, and trading goods. You do get dependent upon things. If indeed it is easier to make arrows out of metal rather than chipping away at it, over a period of time you're going to forget how it is to chip away at it and you're going to need and have only that metal. And in order to have access to those European goods, they needed to continue to find more pelts and more skins and they began to use up their resources to kill all the beaver where they were, kill all the deer and have to go farther and farther inland which meant of course they might bump into other Indians and Indian wars would start with one another which would hurt the Indians. The beaver wars which began in the 1640s didn't end until the Iroquois had wiped out the Huron and emerged as the most powerful of the eastern woodland nations. But trading goods wasn't all the Europeans brought. Disease spread over the people as great destruction. Very many died of it. They could not stir. They could not change positions. And if they stirred, much did they cry out. One of the biggest problems that Native Americans had was the introduction of diseases uh, for which they really had no immunity. And the big disease problems they had in North America, for example, would be influenza, would be measles, uh, would be smallpox. And the effect that it had on the Indians, besides killing them or besides weakening them, is that uh, they lost confidence in themselves. And the effect it could have on uh, Europeans is that it seemed another reinforcement of their own superiority. Epidemics swept up and down the North American coast every few years, weakening or wiping out whole tribes and leaving their land ripe for the taking. Ready to step into the void were the colonists from the British Isles, seeking both religious freedom and riches. A small island nation off the coast of Western Europe England had grown strong under King Henry VIII and his daughter, Queen Elizabeth. By the late 16th century, England was eager to establish its own foothold in the New World. 
England's first North American colony, Roanoke, disappeared without a trace in the 1580s. In 1606, a group of English businessmen set up the Virginia Company of London and sent out 105 men and boys in search of gold. They settled on a swampy peninsula in a place they named Jamestown after their monarch, King James. It's as if we all were shot into outer space and landed on a new planet and then said, here you are. They had to start over again, build shelter, plant food, gather food, build schools and churches. They had to live very primitively. Of course, there were plentiful deer and other animals to be shot, and fish in the waters. So they were not on a desert. There was a lot around them, but they had to start from the very beginning. For several decades, the colony held on by its fingernails. When they weren't fighting among themselves, the early colonists suffered from malnutrition and disease during what became known as the starving time. But newcomers continued to arrive from England, lured by the hopes of making quick money. Loving and kind mother and father, this is to let you understand that I, your child, am in a most heavy case by reason that the nature of the country is such that it causeth much sickness, as maketh the body very poor and weak. We must work hard, both early and late, for a mess of water gruel and a mouthful of bread. We live in fear of the enemy every hour, for our plantation is very weak by reason of the death and sickness of our company. Facing certain death from starvation, the Jamestown colonists had only survived with the help of the local Powhatan tribes, who traded corn and foodstuffs to the colonists in return for knives and guns. The most famous story here, of course, has to do with Pocahontas and John Smith, and how she supposedly throws herself on top of John Smith and keeps the Indians from lopping his head off. And that was a symbolic act, but it is very suggestive of the dependence that the English had on the Indians, because the English could have been destroyed at the back of the hand if they had wanted to do it. Like the Iroquois, the Powhatans hoped to use the Europeans to their advantage in their wars with the neighboring tribes. They didn't appreciate that helping the English would spell their doom. Unable to find gold, the Jamestown colony was on the edge of oblivion when colonist John Rolfe planted some West Indian tobacco seeds and discovered they would grow in the Virginia Tidewater. The Jamestown colonists grew 20,000 pounds in 1618. In 1630, half a million. Why was the King of England so opposed to tobacco when it was becoming Virginia's cash crop? He called it uh, the stinking weed, or it was sometimes called sot weed. And he wrote this little pamphlet called Counterblast to Tobacco. And it, darned if he doesn't sound like our Surgeon General. He said it was tobacco was loathsome to the eye, hateful to the nose, harmful to the brain and dangerous to the lungs. Despite their monarch's objection to tobacco, the English couldn't get enough of the stuff. As the profits from tobacco soared, English colonists poured into the Chesapeake and pushed onto Indian lands. Angered by the land-hungry colonists and their assaults on Indian villages, the Powhatan chief, Opie Cancanau, attacked the Virginia settlements in 1622 and nearly destroyed Jamestown. The survivors responded with equal ferocity. Over the following decades, Virginia's Indian population was ravaged by war and disease. At the same time, the English population grew rapidly as settlers poured into Virginia and Maryland, established in 1632 as a refuge for English Catholics being persecuted at home. That old expression, gold, gospel, and glory, pretty much sums up the, the, the motives for settlement in the, in the New World. Everyone who came to America from Europe hoped somehow to improve the qualities of their lives, whether spiritually or materially. England had an official state church headed by the king. Some English Protestants, called Puritans, thought it was too corrupt and worldly and wanted to reform or purify it. Another smaller and more radical group of Puritans, called Separatists, broke from the church altogether. In November 1620, about a hundred people, including 30 religious Separatists, arrived at Cape Cod on the coast of modern-day Massachusetts. 
These are the people who we know as the pilgrims. A pilgrim is a person who makes a journey for religious reasons. Fearing the corrupting influences and harassment at home, these pilgrims had come to the wilderness to start over and build up a community based on their beliefs. In 1630, a much larger group of about 1,000 Puritans settled a few miles north of the Pilgrims in Massachusetts Bay. They too had come to create a new society based on Christian principles, as Puritan leader John Winthrop explained. The end is to improve our lives and do more service to the Lord and comfort and increase the body of Christ, whereof we are members that ourselves and posterity may be better preserved from the common corruptions of this evil world, to serve the Lord and work out our salvation under the power and purity of his holy ordinance. We shall be as a city upon a hill, the eyes of all people are upon us. The Puritans believed that God had chosen them to redeem Christianity and to serve as a religious model to the world. And to ensure the success of their holy mission, the Puritans made a covenant or agreement with God that ruled every part of their lives. They meant to purify society by coming to America when they didn't think they could do it in England anymore and live a pure life here. I think the simplest way to think of them are people who organize their lives around three things, religion, family, and community. The Puritans came with their families. The family was the foundation of the Puritan covenant, the mother hive out of which both the swarms of state and church issued forth. Within the Puritan society, no one was to live alone. Um, because the idea was that you needed to have other people watch over you, both watch over your, your safety, but also watch over your behavior. No bachelors, no single women. Everyone had to live within a family. If they didn't have their own family, they had to live in someone else's family. No singles in Puritan Massachusetts. Puritan society was patriarchal, that is, governed by men. The father ruled his family, controlling both their economic and religious affairs. The Puritan wife and mother lived under her husband's control, giving up her property and legal rights to her husband when she married. The woman was thought to be the subordinate to the man. A woman, even before she was married, could never travel by herself or really be in public alone. She had to be with a brother, a father, or a husband. The woman's role was to run the home and garden, and most importantly, to bear children. And when the father failed to maintain a peaceful and religious household, the community reserved the right both to excommunicate the father from the church and to take the children from the family for placement in a foster home. What was it like to be a child in a Puritan family? It was certainly to learn obedience from very from the earliest years. The Puritans believed you had to break the will of a child. When that little baby uh, learned to walk and learned to talk and exhibit its own will and a bit of stubbornness, it was thought you had to you had to deal with that child very severely. You spanked them a lot and you shamed them a lot and you taught them a lot about sin as early as you could, um, and you made them understand that they were responsible that their behavior could bring down God's wrath on the whole community, that they were responsible to and for the family and the group around them. It was a pretty heavy trip to lay on a kid. Massachusetts was so concerned about disobedience in children that by the 1640s they passed a disobedient child law which said that a child who sassed its parents and would not obey was liable to capital punishment. Now, the Puritans did not kill any children for being disobedient, but they did put a law on the books to that effect, to warn kids. Childhood in Puritan New England usually ended around ages 10 to 12, when most children were sent to live with other families as indentured servants or apprentices. Not only did these placements enable children to learn a trade, but they believed that such foster families would better impose the strict discipline necessary to raise a child.
The Puritan Covenant required tremendous discipline and constant vigilance. They believed that failure to live up to God's law would bring them disease, death, and eternal suffering. With so much at stake, they showed little tolerance for people who believed in other religions and treated those who disagreed with them harshly. In fact, Puritans treated other Christians with disdain, banishing and at times executing dissenters for their heresies. After arriving in Massachusetts in 1631, Puritan clergyman Roger Williams criticized the colony's leaders for failing to live up to their own ideals and insisted that their charter was invalid because they did not purchase their land from the Indians. The Puritans met Williams' criticisms by banishing him from the colony. Fleeing south, he founded the settlement of Providence in 1636. Soon Williams was followed by another troublesome dissident, Anne Hutchinson, a Puritan housewife and mother of 11, whose preaching began to attract growing numbers of her fellow colonists. She was a remarkable woman, and she was also a compelling, um, absolutely riveting uh, speaker on religious questions. And that disturbed the magistrates and the clergymen. Um, the competition from a, a female who was daring to talk on religious questions put her way outside the boundaries as far as the men of the colony were concerned. And within two years, she was tried for 82 erroneous religious beliefs, and she was banished from Massachusetts. Anne Hutchinson and her children made their way to Rhode Island and helped found the settlement of Portsmouth near Providence. And in 1663, a charter joined them as the colony of Rhode Island, where religious liberty was guaranteed. Their land is spacious and void, and they are few and do but run over the grass, as do also the foxes and wild beasts. They are not industrious, neither have they art, science, skill, or faculty to use the land, but all spoils, rots, and is marred for want of manuring, gathering, ordering. When Europeans arrived in the New World, they were particularly struck between the differences. Among the things that was distressing to them was that these new people were, from their point of view, naked. They were dressed in clothing that was more closely related to the animal from which it came in the first place. By 1640, nearly 20,000 people had joined in the Great Puritan Migration to New England and were pushing out onto Indian lands in Connecticut and New Hampshire, while the Chesapeake colonists continued moving into western parts of Virginia and Maryland. In the 1630s, the Puritans fought and defeated the Pequots of Massachusetts, then recruited Indians into praying villages where they were to dress, live, and worship like Puritans. In the 1670s, New England tribes led by Chief Metacom made one last ditch attempt to drive the English from their lands. The tribes destroyed 12 Puritan towns and attacked 40 others in a war that in relationship to population was the most deadly in American history. The Puritan colonists responded with equal savagery, slaughtering Indian men, women, and children, and selling captives into slavery in the West Indies. While war raged in New England, English colonists and Indians were clashing on Virginia's frontier. Back in 1646, rich lands north of the York River had been reserved for Native Americans. But newcomers to the colony were soon pressuring Governor Sir William Berkeley to let them take Indian lands. Berkeley refused. That wasn't the answer Nathaniel Bacon wanted to hear. A hot-headed lawyer and would-be farmer, Bacon was determined to ruin and extirpate all Indians in general. Taking matters into their own hands, Bacon and a band of followers attacked the Susquehannocks and set off a widening political conflict among Virginians. 
The hostilities didn't end until after Bacon had run Berkeley out of Jamestown and burnt the village to the ground. The Indian Wars of the 1670s took place in the midst of a second wave of colonization, unleashed by the restoration of King Charles II to the English throne in 1660. In the 1640s, while the English colonies were battling between themselves and their Native American neighbors, a bloody civil war was raging in England. Puritans under Oliver Cromwell had taken control of England and killed King Charles I. After Cromwell's death, Parliament restored the monarchy in 1660. The new king gave huge tracts of land in North America to men who had supported him during his years in exile. These proprietary colonies, so-called because they were granted to individuals, cemented English control of the North American coast. King Charles gave the region between the Connecticut and Delaware rivers to his younger brother James, the Duke of York. James then invaded the Dutch colony of New Netherlands, which was renamed New York in his honor. James then gave the jerseys to friends, who sold them to investors, some of whom were English Quakers seeking a refuge from persecution in England. To prevent the Spanish from pushing north from their Florida colonies, in 1663, King Charles gave a huge tract of uncolonized land to another set of followers. This land stretched south from Virginia to Florida. Virginia tobacco planters settled the northern half of the New Carolinas. The southern half was settled by sugar planters from Barbados, who brought their slaves with them. Everywhere the English established new colonies, epidemic diseases, wars, and Indian retreat followed. One of the new proprietary colonies, however, did attempt to apply Christian principles of tolerance and brotherhood to their new neighbors. In 1681, Charles granted the region between Maryland and New York to William Penn, the son of one of the king's old allies. Penn was a member of a radical religious group called the Quakers. The Quakers had taken notions of equality farther than any other Protestants, believing that everyone could experience the inner light of God's grace, and that all were equal in God's eyes, commoners and aristocrats, even females and Native Americans. Quakers took it one step further and said the authority for religion, the decision about what is good religion, ought to lie inside the individual human being. Um, Quakers speak of that as, as that of God in each of us. Um, and that is a central belief in Quaker belief, that one should follow that leading inside oneself. The Quakers were also pacifists who abhorred the use of violence and refused to serve in the king's army or in local militias. The Quakers' radical ideas about equality had already gotten them into trouble in both England and New England. And they told the Quakers, you have the liberty to leave as fast as you can go. And when the Quakers refused, they put them in jail, they branded them, they flogged them, they cut their ears off, they bore through their tongues, and when they would still insist on preaching according to the Quaker beliefs, they finally hanged two Quaker women on Boston Common. Penn established Pennsylvania as a religious experiment based on Quaker ideals, including religious freedom, social equality, and fair dealings with others. They recognized the Indians had a right to the land, and so they were going to trade for that right, negotiate for that right, and buy that right, uh, respecting them as human beings. And I think respect is the key word here, because in approaching the Indians, they tried to approach the Indians as much on the Indians' terms as their own terms. My friends, there is one great God and power that hath made the world and all things therein. Now this great God hath been pleased to make me concerned in your parts of the world, but I do desire to enjoy it with your love and consent that we may always live together as neighbors and good friends. In November of 1682, Penn purchased land from Lenny Lenape chief Tamamen, then imposed strict trade regulations on his colonists, including a ban on the sale of alcohol. 
William Penn and the Quakers in Pennsylvania were almost unique in the way they approached the Indians, the Native Americans. Quakers believed that Indians were capable of being loved by God, that they were God's creatures. Pennsylvania became a refuge for the tribes of Maryland, Virginia, and North Carolina. Penn's religious toleration also attracted large numbers of religious and economic refugees from all over Western Europe. William Penn had advertised in lots of places and encouraged people to come to what he called a haven for those low in the world. When he said that, what he meant was a safe place for those who were struggling, either for economic or for religious reasons, and who wanted a place to, to raise themselves in the world, to make their lives better. Prior to his death in 1718, it was already setting a standard for an inclusive kind of society, a multicultural kind of society, where different kinds of notions about how the world should be and what people should eat and what, how people should worship and what they should wear, all those things were, from Penn's legacy, more open than they were in many other places. Soon, its capital, Philadelphia, was one of the largest and most cosmopolitan cities in the English-speaking world. On the streets of the city, one could hear people speaking many languages, including Swedish, German, French, Welsh, and several West African languages, including Yoruba, Bamanikan, and Igbo. Most people know that Penn called it the city of brotherly love. He counted on brotherly love to dissolve the differences between people of different ethnic backgrounds and different religious beliefs. By the early 1700s, more than 300,000 Europeans and close to 180,000 enslaved Africans lived in England's North American colonies. Old world diseases had turned North America into a killing ground for American Indians. But the cool climate north of the Chesapeake proved extremely healthful to Europeans, who lived longer and produced more children than ever before. Population grew at an unprecedented rate in the American colonies, doubling every 25 years. Nearly the entire east coast of North America was in English hands. To the west, however, the French were constructing a string of forts from Canada to the Gulf of Mexico to maintain control of the fur trade and to wall the English off from the continent's interior. England and France went to war with each other three times between 1689 and 1748. Each war had ended in a stalemate in both Europe and North America. Although the English, by 1750, outnumbered the French in North America almost more than 30 to 1, the French had been able to hold their own and probe deep into North America by cementing alliances with American Indian tribes. The French treated the Indians better than the English did because the French traded with them and didn't take their land from them. The French intermarried with them, tried to learn their languages and deal with the Indians on more of a level playing field. In those places, the relations were different than most English relations were because the English came to settle. They came to bring other Englishmen over and colonize. They brought women as well as men over. They didn't need the Indians as much as the French needed them in those circumstances. The French also sent Jesuit priests who lived with the tribes and learned their culture and ways of life in order to convert them to Catholicism. The Jesuits adjusted their religion to make it appealing to Native Americans, who were amazed at the priests' seemingly magical powers, including the ability to predict eclipses and to communicate over great distances through scratches on pieces of paper. They earned the respect of the Indians over time. Uh, they became less bumblers. They learned the ways of the forest. They learned the Indian languages. That actually won respect among the Indians. It didn't win that many converts, though. But by the 1750s, English expansion and growing competition over the fur trade brought the English into the French-controlled Ohio Valley. As war loomed on the horizon, Delegates from seven English colonies met with the Iroquois in Albany, New York. They wanted to do two things, to forge an alliance with the Iroquois and to unite the separate colonies for a final war against the French. The delegates knew that to win the war with France, they would need the help of the powerful Iroquois Confederation. 
Back in the early 1500s, the Mohawks, Oneidas, Onondagas, Senecas, and Cayuga tribes had forged an alliance. Their Iroquois confederacy was unique not only because of its size, but also because the women of each tribe chose the chiefs and had the power to start or stop wars. The Iroquois were the most powerful Indian nation north of Virginia. And they were geographically positioned in the Mohawk River Valley so that they would have access to both the Hudson River and the Great Lakes region. So they controlled the flow of European goods into the interior and the flow of the products of the forest to the Europeans. That added to their strength. And because they were politically stable and politically powerful and well positioned, every one of the European powers had to make an accommodation with uh, the Iroquois. While the delegates deliberated in Albany, Virginia's royal governor, Robert Dinwiddie, sent a small force of colonial soldiers under the leadership of an inexperienced 22-year-old Virginian by the name of George Washington to prevent the French from building a fort on land in the Ohio Valley claimed by Virginia. Washington attacked the French, then got himself and his men captured in the crudely built Fort Necessity at Great Meadows, Pennsylvania. This foolhardy venture contributed to the outbreak of a war that spread to Europe and beyond. In Europe, they would call it the Seven Years' War. In America, the French and Indian War. In July of 1755, a combined force of French Indians ambushed troops under General Edward Braddock, killing or wounding almost half of the English soldiers. Indian raiding parties supported by the French terrorized English settlers and reduced the colonies to desperation. For the next three years, the French and their Indian allies won a series of victories. The tide began to turn in 1757 when England sent a huge reinforcement of troops. In July 1758, the British recaptured the French fortress at Louisbourg, which controlled the entrance to the St. Lawrence. Although they had supported the French in secret, the Iroquois had officially remained neutral. Realizing that the French were going to lose, they joined forces with the English and in July 1759 helped drive the French out of Fort Niagara, opening the way for the British to move west. In September, General James Wolfe defeated the French on the Plains of Abraham and took Quebec. Although English victory was now assured, the war dragged on another year before the final French defeat. Three years later, in the Treaty of Paris, the French ceded Canada and all land east of the Mississippi to England. A hundred and fifty years after a handful of men and boys had started England's first permanent colony in North America, England was now in control of the eastern half of the North America continent. English colonization had brought irreversible changes to America. Native American nations had been crippled by disease, war, and land encroachment. The riches of the land, sky, and earth, which had been theirs alone just over a century before, were now controlled by the European newcomers. The expulsion of the French destroyed the balance of power that Indian nations had exploited to remain independent. In the early 1760s, Creeks and Cherokees attacked the Virginia and Carolina frontiers. Tribes in the Ohio Valley under War Chief Pontiac of the Ottawa raided Virginia and western Pennsylvania to halt the advancing waves of European settlers. The proclamation of 1763 would temporarily halt settlers from pouring onto Indian lands west of the Appalachians, but they would soon push yet deeper into the continent, unleashing a new series of wars with Indian nations. By 1763, the population of England's 13 North American colonies had swelled to close to 2 million people of European and African descent. The emerging colonial societies were forming their own distinctive identities. In the northern colonies, the religious principles of the Pilgrims, Puritans, and Quakers had taken firm root. 
Although in practice, the new Americans often failed to live up to their ideals, the variety of people of different faiths and cultures living together had created societies more tolerant and open than those they had left behind in Europe. Separated from England by a vast ocean, the colonies were also growing well-schooled in self-government and management of their own affairs. And they were growing wealthy, supplying food, sugar, and raw materials to European consumers. European colonists prospered from North America's natural resources. They did so by participating in an expanding international economy built upon the labor not just of European immigrants, but enslaved Africans as well. <laughs> 